speaker will be uh, Dr. Kali from the Colorado School of Mines, and he will speak on methanology composition, which is synthesis gas using metal catalysts on lanthanum modified supports. I'd like to start off by recognizing my co-authors on this uh, paper. I inadvertently, when I sent in the abstract, left one of their names off. That's uh, Judge Porn Wittiakun, who has just recently finished his degree with us. Uh, my other co-authors are David Wickham and Mike Harpuck of TDA, and Boyce Logston, who is at PG&G. Most people, when you talk about uh, synthesis gas, are talking about taking the synthesis gas and using it to prepare methanol. Uh, I'm going in, in the reverse direction, and that is taking methanol, decomposing it into synthesis gas. And you may wonder why anyone would want to do that. There is a practical reason for doing that. I'm going to, I'm going to show you what that is. Um, as you're all aware, uh, methanol is considered to be a clean, uh, a clean burning alternative to gasoline. However, it suffers from some distinct disadvantages. One of those is that it has a lower heating value uh, on a volumetric basis than it does gasoline. And consequently, it takes more uh, on a volumetric basis of, of methanol to drive the same distance. Uh, if we were to take advantage, however, of some of the alcohol chemistry that's available to us with methanol, and decompose or dissociate methanol into carbon monoxide and, and hydrogen on board a vehicle, we can take advantage of that reaction and use that to improve the fuel economy. Uh, I'm illustrating that here as follows. If I take uh, methanol and combust that, uh, we release about 321 kilocalories for every two moles of methanol. If I uh, take that and decompose it, on board a vehicle to make carbon monoxide and hydrogen instead, and that is a uh, endothermic reaction, I improve the heating value of that fuel uh, by about 14%. Uh, so that is the reason that we're looking at that. These are the reactions that we're going to be concerned with as we get into the catalyst development part of this. Uh, again, we're looking, we're interested in this specific reaction, methanol dissociation to form uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. It's an endothermic reaction, absorbs about 50 kilocalories uh, of heat for every two moles of, of methanol. These are some other reactions that we have to be concerned with. Methanol will also, if there's an acid present, decompose or de dehydrate to form dimethyl ether. Uh, that's an exothermic reaction, and that is detrimental to our process, and so we want to develop a catalyst that has very selective for the decomposition reaction but it's not active in the dehydration reaction. Another reaction that's of concern to us is that carbon monoxide will also uh, dissociate on the surface of the metal and form a surface carbon species and oxygen species. And if there's sufficient uh, hydrogen available on the surface, you can remove that in the form of methane. And methane is one of the other products we observe. Or it can uh, polymerize <coughs> on the surface and form a carbon film. The carbon film is the primary uh, source of deactivation for our catalyst that we're going to be looking at. Uh, oxygen uh, can react with hydrogen to form water or carbon monoxide to form CO2 and both of those are also observed as products in this reaction. I thought I would show you what the uh, onboard reformer or, or dissociation reactor looks like. Uh, by the way, um, this process is referred to as methanol decomposition, methanol dissociation, or methanol dehydration. All three of those terms are, are used in the literature. Um, uh, chemists tend to prefer to use the word decomposition. Engineers tend to use the word dissociation. Uh, I think engineers feel that dissociation or, or decomposition sounds like something's decaying. 
and so uh, prefer the dissociation term. Uh, if I have uh, methanol in the fuel tank, pass it through a, a boiler, vaporize it. This is a preheater or a superheater that uh, brings the reactor, the methanol vapor, up to temperature and then go into a catalytic reformer. This is a tube and shell heat exchanger. Uh, the catalyst is mounted on the inside here. Waste heat that's coming out of the combustion process is now being absorbed. So this endothermic, this is driving the endothermic reaction. And the product gases, carbon monoxide and hydrogen, are then taken over to the intake manifold and burned as the fuel. So rather than throwing your, your heat out to the environment, you're actually recovering it and improving the heating value of your fuel in this process. And for that reason, people refer to this process or this, this, these kinds of fuels as endothermic fuels. Uh, this is just to uh, illustrate that we actually uh, did incorporate this into a vehicle and test it. This is a Ford Escort. Uh, the catalytic converter is actually mounted right off the side, right here in the front, off the side of the engine. Uh, it's, a, it's a small device, and uh, we saw about a 20% improvement in fuel economy using this dissociation reactor. Uh, hydrocarbon emissions were uh, substantially lower, as well as uh, NOx emissions. Uh, carbon monoxide emissions uh, had very little effect on it. I mentioned in the abstract that we were also, this was also under consideration for the hypersonic flight program. NASA and the Air Force have uh, both been interested in endothermic fuels, and the reason for that is uh, hypersonic aircraft are, are those aircraft that fly in Mach numbers higher than Mach 3. We were looking at a system that would be able to fly a, a, a aircraft at Mach 8 and uh, still be able to cool the aircraft down. Uh, one of the criteria you have for this kind of an aircraft is that you need hydrogen as a fuel to prop in order to propagate a flame fast enough to drive that, uh, or to propel that aircraft at, at those very high Mach numbers, you need hydrogen. Uh, one way of, of doing that, of course, is to use liquid hydrogen on board. Uh, liquid hydrogen has a, a, a much larger volume than, than most other liquids. You have to have cryogenic tanks. Uh, that makes that impractical. So we're looking at ways of using another liquid fuel that we can onboard, dissociate, or, or decompose into hydrogen and use that as the fuel. Uh, methanol was one of the candidates for this, and it was studied. The other advantage is that when you're flying at Mach 8, the leading edges of the aircraft are very, very hot. You've got uh, 3,260 uh, 3, degrees uh, Fahrenheit at the, at the very tip of that aircraft. So we've got to be able to cool the aircraft, the avionics, the pilot. Uh, and uh, one way of doing that is to use the endothermic process to absorb that heat, cool the aircraft, generate the hydrogen at the same time. And when we got into this, there really wasn't a catalyst uh, that worked well for this particular application. We tested quite a few uh, commercial catalysts, but uh, all of them failed for one reason or another. Uh, we realized, though, that we needed the following uh, uh, type of functions in our catalyst. Number one, we needed a metal function for the decomposition reaction. Uh, all of these metals will participate in that reaction, however, palladium and platinum are by far the best for that uh, particular application. <clears throat> we also needed a support uh, that would disperse the metal uh, uh, very well. Uh, we needed high dispersion in order to have high activity, and, and uh, that is critical to us because these uh, reactors need to be as small and compact as possible. Also, uh, we needed a support that was not acidic. And uh, the, the best candidate for, uh, for that was alumina, but alumina, as you know, is, is a city. In order to overcome that problem, we then took alumina, treated it with a basic oxide to, to neutralize that acidity, and then uh, uh, placed the metal on top of that. We also looked at silica. Silica is not a city, <coughs> but it, it's very poor in terms of dispersing metals. Uh, when we treated that silica with lanthana, we found that the dispersion was much better 
and the activity was, was uh, much higher than we anticipated. So uh, pictorially, this is what we've, what we've generated, a support that has uh, some sort of a, an oxide modifier on the surface and palladium metal on top of that, or platinum metal. Um, these catalysts are going to be subjected to a, a very large temperature range, uh, anywhere from 300 degrees centigrade all the way up to 550 degrees centigrade. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they had sufficient st thermal stability to survive that kind of thermal fluctuation. This test was actually set up to evaluate that. Uh, these are the catalysts that we looked at. This is the initial activity at 300 degrees centigrade and the initial selectivity for making CO and hydrogen. This is the final activity after we uh, took the temperature up to 550 degrees centigrade and then returned back to the uh, initial test condition. You can see that uh, these are uh, the catalysts where we have an alumina support and we've modified the supports with lithia, magnesia, and lanthanum. Uh, the initial activity of these catalysts vary quite markedly depending on what uh, modifier we're using on that support. The selectivity, in the case of the palladium on alumina, is relatively low because we're making dimethyl ether. Uh, when we add these uh, basic oxides, the selectivity goes uh, into the realm that we'd like to see it in terms of, uh, of generating the, uh, the endotherm that we need for this process. Uh, However, none of these catalysts, as you can see, survive the high temperature excursion. When uh, we return to the 300 degree temperature, all of them had lost activity. Uh, we uh, were able to determine that that was a carbon film. Uh, we were able to burn that off, regenerate the activity. Uh, we could basically go right back to the, the initial activity. Uh, if we used platinum as a metal instead, You'll notice that the initial activity isn't as high as palladium. Uh, however, uh, it would survive these thermal cycles. And when we modified the supports with these basic oxides, in each case, uh, we saw that the catalyst went through the thermal cycle without any problem. Uh, we feel what's happening here is that we're, we're putting on a carbon film, particularly on the, the palladium, and that uh, uh, this, the rate of forming that carbon film is obviously higher in the case of palladium than it is in the, in the case of platinum. In the case of platinum, you're removing that carbon in the, for, in the form of methane at a, at a, at a uh, fast enough rate that the carbon film does not build up on the surface. Uh, we at, looked at the palladium catalyst with a higher metal loading. The previous uh, metal loadings were uh, 0.5 weight percent. These all have 3 weight percent on them. And uh, we wanted to do that so that we could characterize these catalysts a little more easily. Also, uh, to follow the uh, effect of the deactivation uh, a little more closely. It turns out that, uh, again, we saw a similar effect uh, in terms of adding the modifier uh, on the alumina. It, it had an effect on the initial activity. Selectivities were all very good when we had the uh, modifier in place. Uh, final activities were interesting. In, in the case of lithium, we lost almost all the activities. We go down the periodic table, down to cesium, you see there's almost no loss in activity. L uh, lanthanum is similar. Uh, uh, going through a thermal cycle, under the test conditions we used, we, we saw very little loss in activity, which would indicate that these modifiers are also having an effect on the metal, not only neutralizing support, but they're interacting very strongly with the, the metal itself. Uh, we we uh, looked at uh, these catalysts using X-ray diffraction. Uh, this is one that uh, is very interesting. Platinum on a silica, support silica, as I mentioned before, is, is notorious for not being a very good support for dispersing metals. And you see we have very sharp peaks, uh, an average particle diameter of about 590 angstroms. Uh, however, uh, if I dope that surface first with lanthana, and then look at the x-ray diffraction, we have 38 angstrom particle diameters. 
as, a, as an average particle diameter. So the dispersion on this is enhanced dramatically by having the lanthana uh, placed on the silica. Uh, these are some chemisorption results. Uh, what is interesting here, these are the alumina supports. Uh, platinum is the metal that's, uh, that's impregnated on the, on the support. These are the various uh, modifiers that were used. You can see that the dispersion is, is actually good uh, for all of those metals. Uh, or, excuse me. <laughs> it is better for, uh, uh, well, the dispersion is, is actually very, very similar for all of those modifiers. The modifiers don't have uh, uh, too much of an effect on the dispersion of the metal. However, when we get to the silica, again, uh, an unmodified uh, support has very large crystallites. The, uh, the, the, the silica supports that's been uh, treated with uh, lanthana uh, is very, very highly dispersed metal. This, this is a, uh, a case where we have a 2 weight percent, 5 and 10 weight percent loading of, of lanthana. Uh, this is uh, an attempt to try and explain uh, what might be going on here. It's apparent that we have a very strong interaction between uh, the platinum and palladium. Palladium uh, shows very similar uh, properties on the uh, silica supports as well. Uh, an unmodified surface, we have relatively large crystallites. Uh, when we put the uh, lanthana down, uh, we would expect if, if um, we had, for example, patches of lanthana and open areas with uh, 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 of silica, you would see a high dispersion if you have a strong affinity for the lanthana and large crystallites uh, on the silica itself. And when we get to low lanthana loadings, we actually see that. We'll see very broad, band, uh, broad uh, diffraction pattern uh, with a very sharp peak on top of it. So we're, we're, once we get to a certain critical lanthana doping, we start to see very large crystallites on the silica showing up as well. Uh, just We estimated approximately uh, what, what surface coverage we might be looking at, and it's about 3 to 8 percent. So uh, uh, this, uh, it, you can either look at this of one of two ways. Either you're forming some sort of a, a patch on the surface where the platinum is very strongly associated with that patch, or somehow it's uniformly distributed across there, and again, that the, uh, the platinum or the palladium are strongly affiliated with that, that lanthanum species. Uh, temperature program desorption using ammonia. Uh, looking at the alumina supports, uh, we see that the unmodified catalyst, we have a, a low temperature and a high temperature peak where ammonia desorbed. Uh, treatment with any of these basic oxides uh, uh, eliminates or reduces substantially the area under that high temperature peak. So we're removing uh, these uh, acid sites or Lewis acid sites that are these are, the, are, are these are the Lewis acid sites that are primarily responsible for the formation of the dimethyl ether. And uh, u utilizing those modifiers has basically eliminated those sites since we don't see any dimethyl ether as a product once the aluminum catalyst is treated. Um, what's happening, uh, we have Lewis acid sites that are responsible for the absorption of methanol to form hydroxyl and methoxyl groups. Uh, two methoxyl groups can uh, combine to form dimethyl ether, regenerate our Lewis acid site. Uh, once you've treated that with a basic oxide, you, you remove that Lewis acid site uh, in terms of its availability for the reaction, you, you've neutralized it. So uh, the, the, the function of the modifier in terms of the alumina catalyst is to tie up Lewis acid sites and eliminate that acidity. Uh, we did some temperature program desorption studies. Um, this is a, um, a palladium catalyst. It's on a, uh, uh, a modified alumina support. Interestingly enough here, we see that as we go down the periodic table from lithium down to cesium, we see a change in the amount of carbon dioxide versus carbon oxide that's, that's uh, 
desorbed from the surface. And uh, you can see as we get down to cesium, cesium was one of the catalysts that didn't, uh, that showed a much slower rate of deactivation. Lithium deactivates very rapidly. Uh, this would indicate that the carbon monoxide dissociation occurs much more rapidly on this, with this modifier being present than when you have the, the, the cesium. Lanthanum, lanthanum uh, behaves very similar to the cesium material. Uh, that would indicate that the interaction, there, there must be a strong interaction between the metal and these modifiers as well. It's not only just modifying the support, but it's interacting very strongly with the metal. And that's illustrated here uh, as we look at the uh, activity in terms of methanol decomposition, we, uh, we measured the surface area of a variety of these catalysts using chemisorption, hydrogen chemisorption, and CO chemisorption, uh, and plotted that versus activity. Initially, it didn't look like we had much of a correlation. We thought there would be just a nice straight line through all these data points. But as we looked at it uh, more carefully, uh, we can see that the unmodified catalyst and the catalyst that was treated with lithia all fall on the, all those data points fall on one line, and the, and the lanthanum, which showed the slowest uh, rate of deactivation, has a, a line that's higher. This would suggest to me that what we have here is a strong metal support type of interaction, or uh, as has been postulated by other authors, that we've got some migration of these uh, dopant or these modifiers on the on the surface onto the metal itself, and that's uh, uh, affecting the activity of the metal. On the silica, it's even more dramatic. Uh, we have very low activity uh, on the unmodified uh, platinum uh, uh, supported on silica. Doping those with lanthanum or, or uh, cerium improves that dispersion, but it also increases the activity much, much uh, to a much higher extent than you would expect. Uh, we uh, try to uh, correlate this with uh, various properties of these cations as we, uh, that we impregnated on, the, on these supports. And uh, this was the only correlation we found that worked out fairly well, and that is the charge density of the cation itself versus the activity ratio. The activity ratio is our way of measuring the uh, the rate of deactivation of this catalyst as, as this carbon film forms. And you can see the lithium was the worst, uh, cesium was the best. All of these fall on a nice curve here except for lanthanum. Lanthanum is the only one that doesn't fit. Uh, that's assuming, however, that lanthanum is in a plus three oxidation state. And uh, if one assumes that you have a different oxidation state, like a plus one oxidation state, that was also proposed by uh, uh, Hicks and Bell. Uh, that moves right over on top of this spot right there. And again, we would suggest that if we do have lanthanum migrating to the surface of these metal crystallines, that we probably have a plus one oxidation state and not a plus three oxidation state. Uh, I, we can conclude that uh, modifying these supports with these basic oxides improves, number one, the metal dispersion, particularly when we use uh, uh, lanthanum or ceria. We have a dramatic improvement in the metal dispersion. Uh, in the case of the aluminum oxide supports, it neutralizes the acidity. It uh, doesn't have a big effect on the dispersion since uh, alumina tends to be a, a fairly good dispersant material to begin with. And there is evidence that these modifiers are indeed altering the activity of the metal as well. Just like to acknowledge uh, our funding sources, TDA, Department of Energy, National Renewable Energy Lab, and the Air Force. Thank you for your attention. Do we have questions? Yes. Julian Ross, University of Limerick. Uh, the uh, steam reforming of methanol has also been used in these sorts of situations. Have you considered using steam reforming? It's also endothermic and, uh, of course, uh, might have some advantages. Uh, 
Uh, we have we have thought about that, but uh, uh, have focused pretty much on this aspect. Steam reforming is a possibility. Uh, I, I think most people are looking at at that primarily for fuel cell applications, where you want uh, to uh, produce only hydrogen. And it, it turns out, in the case of the um, uh, hypersonic flight project. Um, a little bit of carbon monoxide is necessary to prevent a flame out in the engine at very high velocities. Uh, and um, that's, that's a bad thing. Flame outs at real high velocity. <laughs> are, are yes. So, so uh, uh, that was, uh, from, from that standpoint, it, we wanted to stay with the dissociation. Yeah. Did you, uh, I didn't see the normal methanol synthesis catalyst, which you might think would be uh, the copper zinc oxide you think would be a, a reasonable candidate for uh, recomposition. Did you consider that one? Did you yes. Evaluate it? Yeah, we eliminated, that was our first candidate. And, <laughs> oh, okay. and, and, and eliminated that right off the bat. It, uh, it, it, it's very mechanically soft. Uh, it's also um, uh, very sensitive to these thermal cycles. It deactivates completely. And whereas in, this, in the case of uh, these catalysts, we could actually regenerate them, uh, we could not regenerate the copper zinc oxide catalysts once they went through a thermal cycle. I, okay, I'll, I'll come back. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought I noticed something in, in your uh, overheads where the uh, low weight loading uh, palladium on alumina uh, showed a severe deactivation, but the high weight loading did not. Uh, oh, I, I, I think that in, in the time frame of our <coughs> test, uh, if we'd gone long enough, we would have de de deactivated the, the higher weight loading oh. as well. Yeah. And, and it's very temperature sensitive. I didn't mention that, but if we uh, drop the temperature, the palladium catalyst will survive. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very sensitive to how high a temperature you take this test to. In the back. Uh, George Gallagher from Aristec. Uh, in uh, the portion where you are talking about the role of the as a modifier, you suggest that suggested elsewhere you get decoration up on the surface. Now typically when that kind of decoration is observed, you see a suppression in the uh, uh, surface area is measured by a particular CO chem absorption, but also by hydrogen chem absorption. And that didn't appear to be the case with with these catalysts. Uh, we, we didn't see it with the aluminum, but we did see it with uh, silica, particularly with lithium and sodium. But, but lanthana, that wasn't observed. He, uh, uh, we don't see any suppression in, in, in hydrogen or CO absorption. Uh, Ron Mann from RMC Canada. Uh, you mentioned several times the thermal cycle from 300 to 5 or 550. I don't think I heard you say how long it stayed at 550. Yeah, we kept it at uh, 550 for about two hours, I think during that cycle, so the, the, the deactivation occurs very rapidly at those temperatures. Uh, it, it occurs at lower temperatures at a much lower rate, and, and at some point, if you, if you drop the temperature low enough, the uh, methanation reaction is sufficiently fast so that you never build up a film, you can keep a constant activity. I think that's all the time we have. Let's thank our speaker. <laughs> Last but not